As I wrestled with this assigned passage, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, so if you have your Bibles, you can open up there, and the title of my message is From Bad to Worst. Um, (laughs) I think even in this Sunday, I'm reminded of the providence of God, um, how in every single aspect of everything we go through, we're dealing with, and even the organization of this service, God is working and weaving a message above and beyond and even outside of anything I share within these next few minutes. And so the songs we sang before this passage is not by mistake. Um, The call to worship that Jordan gave us is not by mistake. Everything you went through to get to this service is not by mistake. What you've experienced this week that we've just passed or the weeks before, the tension you might be feeling, everything serves a specific purpose. And for some of you, I pray that the climax of that deliverance, if you will, from The past week's challenges is through this word, but for some of you, even this might give you more tension that you leave out with, and the Lord is continuing to bring you to a place or a point of clarity that you can greater understand that all he is doing in your life and in in your world, so to speak. So with that said, will you stand with me as we read um, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 8? And I'll read it. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Say that last part again. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry. I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Father, I come before you this morning. Weak and highly inept apart from the grace and the spirit of God. So Father, I pray you would rid me of any self-reliance, that I would throw myself on the altar of grace, and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, I might convey your word as you would see fit for the sanctification and the exhortation of your children in this room. Lord, I pray for the people in this room and those who are listening online, or who will listen online. I pray that you would soften their hearts, so that they might be fertile soil for the the seed of your word to be planted, that it will bear much fruit, Lord, that you will overwhelm us with what we deserve, but then overwhelm us by what you also have given. Because we cannot truly be grateful for what we have now if we do not fully realize what we should have had. Lord, I pray even in this room against distractions, I pray that you would help me communicate in a way that from all ages that are here, they will hear your word and be encouraged and learn from it and be able to apply it in the different um, spheres of influence. God, I need you. We need you. Answer us. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I feel like we can never ever be naive enough to say that we didn't know before 2020 that bad things happened. But I think what kind of happened is that 
when we were all at home quarantining or staying at home and not doing the other things we might throw into our daily schedules and routines to distract us, we were made even more aware because that's all we had to focus on. Maybe the TV screen and keep it real, Netflix and all those different streamings. You're like, I ain't got nothing else to do, so I might as well fill myself up with what's going on around the world. So with not being able to get out more, the brokenness of this world, at least for me, became even more apparent. COVID-19, the deaths, the the election and the drama that brought and, and the protests and the extreme poverty all over the world. The reality is, as human beings, we may be in more Cases than before, for for some of us people that have been a little bit too sensitized, if you will, have been overwhelmed by how broken our world is indeed. During the quarantine 2020, I stumbled upon this, this crime documentary that I watched. And it was heartbreaking and absolutely bewildering when I was given a full presentation of how broken and holistically corrupt... Mankind is apart from the grace of God. It was this this family that looked like the typical American family. White picket fence, uh, two kids, one on the way, great wife and a good looking husband. Before you know it, there's news that the wife and the kids have have all gone missing. News pundits are, are wondering what happened about it. The guy, the father, even makes it on the news about what took place at his home. And there he is making this public plea to someone help me find my wife. Someone help me find my six-year-old daughter and my three-year-old daughter. And my wife was pregnant, so the child to come. His name was Nico. And so at this point, everybody in Colorado, which is where this happened, is is frantic. They're looking for this family only to begin to find out that this very man that so convincingly portrayed himself as a man who was desperate to discover his family was the very person that killed them. The weight of extreme violence, but also lust because he was having an affair with another lady and he wanted to be with her forever. And so he turned to his wife of his youth, ended her life and looked at his kids, both six and three. And as they pleaded with their father to save them, he instead chose to take their lives. Why? Out out of a fullness of wickedness and evil overtaken and controlled and consumed by lust and violence, the very thing that in his DNA before the brokenness of sin, he was called to lead, to protect, and to provide for, he sought to get rid of. And as I'm reading this passage and we see that, again, all the way from Cain, we thought it couldn't get bad, but then it begins to get even more worse as people come, as generations come, and as more and more humans are all over the earth, we are reminded of just how broken we as human beings are. And that the very fact that we are sometimes sometimes surprised when we see the fruits of this brokenness isn't isn't a denial of how broken we are ourselves. It's just how self-deceived we really are. How we have been able to create these different masks and shields and boundaries to where we can glorify and shock at other people's brokenness but yet be in denial about our own. The wars and rumors of wars. The many of families that have sent their sons and daughters to fight for justice and never had them come back, blood, tears, wailing, crying, has been the constant melody that has followed humanity ever since Eve and Adam disobeyed God's instruction. But as suffering and as evil has been now, so it was also back then. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 8 What I want to do this morning is to break it down into three different sections. The first is the situation at hand that is being described. And the second is God's judgment. But then the third is God's solution. So look at me here with verses 1 to verse 5. Verses 4, sorry. It reads again, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever. 
For he is flesh, his days shall be 120. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. It's very tempting as 21st century Christians when we see a kind of people that don't really make sense to, to fit fixated on that. Who are, the, who are the Nephilim? Who are the sons of God? And I think it's appropriate to kind of phrase it like this. Who are the sons of God? What is very clear from the passage first is this, is that all the people that were listening to Moses recount or give this account of the history of this people knew who these guys were, or at least what their slogan was. It's also very clear from this passage that the focus isn't necessarily who these people are, but what they did. And we see what they did. They took many a wives, defiled them, and went against the order and the design that God had created for his created things. And so these first four verses set the stage, if you will, for the Noah narrative, for what's about to take place. Moses is using these first four verses to describe just how depraved, just how messed up, just how broken and rebellious humanity had become and all other living creatures. As I tried to decipher a clear explanation of what the sons of God is, I was overwhelmed by so many good and clear arguments and cases to where I cannot confidently in my own conscience say this is specifically what they are. But I do think we have an inkling. I personally lean towards some of the fallen angels that were cast out with Satan. But there is also this really good argument that Merely Moses in these verses is just trying to explain the wickedness of the leadership in a lot of those big countries, right? So I'm not sure if you remember in Daniel chapter 10, verses 38, when Daniel had been praying to God and then he had been, um, his prayer had been hindered or delayed by the prince of Persia. And so in Hebrew theology, there is this very clear understanding that there is a spiritual connection between the broken and wicked leadership of this world and the principalities of this air, demonic principalities of this air that were also alive and working in this time. And so some theologians who I believe love the Lord, are filled with the Holy Ghost and believe in the authority of Scripture would argue that Moses right there is referencing that lineage, that lineage of that demonic presence in this broken world that gave certain people power, renown, and fame. But I think the most important thing we are called to get from these four verses is that it was really bad. Things had gotten worse. Verse 1, when man began to multiply on the face of the land, it didn't get any better between that present moment in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, than it did in Genesis chapter 3. The brokenness as people increased began to increase also. So much so that the Lord who breathed the very life in mankind looked at mankind and said, my spirit cannot abide with man forever. Again, already we begin to get this idea of who our God is. And one of the beauties of the Old Testament and the whole Bible, but I, you know, preferences with the Old Testament a little bit in terms of how the Hebrew reads, is this. It's that the Old Testament declares and shouts out very loudly the holiness of God. And how pure and how intolerant of sin that he is indeed. But it also shouts just as loud to the grace of God. But it's very important that we sit down, we set up our tents, we start a little fire, and we cook some meals and sit in the holiness of God. When God says that his spirit shall not abide in man, it means they can't sit in the same room anymore. And it's very important that we begin to remind ourselves of the history that we've just left in those last five chapters. How was it before? How was it before sin really came in and messed everything up? In the middle of the day, the Lord would come into the garden and walk with his creation. There was communion and there was fellowship. But the very fact that we only see God fully communicate this in Genesis chapter 6 speaks to the fact that though God did away with us because of our sin, his heart always desired to have some sort of a relationship with us broken people. I promise you in these next few minutes, we're going to encounter the judgment and the holiness of God. But please always hear, even in the midst of his judgment, 
his everlasting grace and love for those whom he's created. He can't continue anymore to abide with this creation that continually rejects his instruction but also goes against his design. What is even crazy is that if we fast forward to present day right now, we know how our world is constantly perpetuating narratives that scream against how God originally designed things. We know that what sells and what is popular today is everything that tries to normalize a radical rebellion of all things that God created for his purpose and for his glory somehow one could argue we are worse than how it was then but yet we are still alive and able to gather here and the person who is cursing God's name still has breath to continue cursing is it not but anything other than the grace of God that continues to persist with a broken and stubborn people it's just as it is now so it was back then. And so those first four verses are articulating the situation. But now we're going to move to verse 5 and look at God's judgment. Verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. I always say this and I'll always say it. The Bible never over-exaggerates. So when you begin to see descriptive words that describe just how weighty the disobedience is, know that your mind cannot fully comprehend just how bad things have gotten but it got really bad. And so again, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention, every, the wholeness and the weight of that statement of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. Throughout the Bible, you see it a lot in the Psalms, God, the psalmist or the writer of the Bible, different books of the Bible, gives God these human features. And one of the reasons why he does that is to be able to really communicate to each and every one of us that read, study, and hear God's word proclaimed how it is God is feeling, reacting, and responding to a particular situation. It is insane that the word here used is regretted. The God who at one point created all things, and what did he say? What's good? And so, again, the author is forcing and pushing it down our minds and even into our hearts just how bad and how broken things were. But then it also brings this endearing father-like personhood to our God when he says at the end of that verse 6, and it grieved him to his heart heart. Again, even when God is bringing about his wrath and his judgment on those who willfully reject him, do not mischaracterize or create a false picture of my, our God, as though even in the midst of his exerting of wrath and judgment, there is no mercy that there is no endearment, that there is no God who genuinely cares for the people that perpetually, willingly, and are always rejecting his plan and his design for them. God is, will always be, primarily be a loving God, but he is also holy. And so where there is sin and where there is public rebellion of his will and of his leadership, it will be met with judgment. And so in verse 7, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry. That other word could be translated, for I repent, God, repenting. What has he repented of? He's repented that he has made him. Remembering or being reminded of the, the brokenness, even of the first story that I heard, I asked myself as I was preparing to preach this passage, how am I grieved over sin? That can be a danger for many of us, those who have lived long enough, far longer than me, and seeing the different ways that this world has borne fruit to its brokenness to develop a, some sort of an apathy, right? 
It's understandable to a certain extent. I mean, you might not want to watch the news as much as you do. You might not want to engage in certain conversations, stay completely afar when you hear certain topics as you're walking by because you are so overwhelmed by the brokenness of this world that you begin to close up the doors and almost create this false utopia as though everything really is perfect in your sphere of influence so I don't need to bother about anything else. The challenge throughout the Christian's life and the call when we are in relationship to God is that we somehow have to walk in this tension of being broken by the world around us, its rebellion and its sin, but yet have an eternal hope that Jesus Christ is going to restore all things. But both things are meant to be felt and carried, if you will, faithfully. And so just as our Father in heaven, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, are grieved by the sin of mankind, we too, as his image bearers, especially restored image bearers by the blood of Jesus Christ, are called to be a people that are broken by the brokenness of the world that we live in, while still maintaining a strong, vibrant hope of his return and restoration. Are we grieved by sin? Are we grieved as our creator is grieved? And, and you, know, you notice in that first example I gave, the sin was of the other. But how are we grieved by our own? As human beings, we have this masterful propensity to be so fully aware of the sins of other people and the many nuances of it and the different angles and shades that it possesses and maybe even the different colors of it. But when it comes to our own, we talk and sound like Daffy Duck trying to articulate something to Mickey Mouse. We have no clue. And if we really do understand the great grace of God, then that in turn should force us to really understand just how broken we are and how apart from the grace of God, we are the chief sinners in our own eyes because when instruction comes, we examine self first before we astute our judgment on others. The best corrections I have ever received have been from people who I knew lived a habit of calling themselves to order publicly before they called out others. And that habit, that culture perpetuates itself, and I pray it perpetuates itself even in this body, that we will be a people that are grieved by sin, grieved by the brokenness of the world, but realize that the brokenness and the grief should start with us. But God was so overwhelmed by the brokenness of humanity that he said he will blot us out. When was the last time you heard that phrase, that I will blot them out? It had to do with our sin. He would blot out our transgressions. But before it was used, man, that preaches that. In the moment, in the moment. But before it was used by the blood of Jesus Christ to cancel out or blot out our own sins, it first was used when God was overwhelmed by the weight of our brokenness that he will indeed eventually die for and then decided he would blot every single living thing out because all has been marred by the corruption of humanity. As sin increased then in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, so sin increases now. As God was grieved then in Genesis chapter 6, so God is grieved right now. But hear this, but as God showed favor to Noah then, so God is showing favor to us now. This brings us to my third point, the solution. But Noah found favor. In the eyes of the Lord. Somehow, somehow, growing up and the touches I had in Sunday school, I always thought that Noah did something. I always thought that there was something good in Noah that made God see Noah and choose to show favor. But then after the flood abates, and I'm jumping a little ahead, so whoever's preaching, don't hurt me. Noah messes up. 
And if you really think about it throughout the whole of Genesis and the whole narrative, there really is no clear indication that there is something beautiful and great about Noah. What is very clear is the very fact that God showed favor on Noah. Ain't nothing Noah could have done. He couldn't have spoke better. He couldn't have looked better. He couldn't have dressed better on the Sabbath on Saturday. God found favor on Noah. One of the biggest privileges I get to serve in this church is to meet and to hear from so many of you. To spend time with you over coffee, to hear your stories, to hear the different ways that I can pray for you. And so as I encountered this passage, that verse 8 was rocking me. And it wasn't rocking me just because of me. It was rocking me on behalf of you. See, there are many in, in of you in this room that if I asked you to give me a list of reasons why God shouldn't love you, you would give me. There are many of you in this room that are so aware and overwhelmed by the many ways that you are disqualified from the love of God as you deem it. That all that I've said before, you're like, Daniel, I know, I know. I mean, I've known this. I've heard this before. It's breaking me. It's weighing on me. It's affecting my marriage, my relationship with my kids, in my job. It's affecting every single part of me. What can I do? And the answer is you can do nothing. But the answer also is, is that God has done everything and he has chosen to find favor with you. Whether you are a child of God today, whether you are professing him as Lord and Savior this morning, it don't matter. If you are here in this room, then he has found favor because he has given you an opportunity to hear the word of the Lord and to respond favorably and positively to it. Every single day we wake up, we give God a million reasons why he should not love us. And every single time we do that, God says, get that out of here. I have chosen to show you favor. As I was preparing this message, I was reminded of a passage in the New Testament. Something we've preached before when we went through Ephesians. And again, in that New Testament passage, there's that but there. I don't know what it is about the, that but in the Bible. It just always gets my goosebumps going. Let's look at it for a second. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. And this is Paul that's saying this. He said, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You are following the course of this world. We've seen the course of this world, right? In those first four verses. Following the prince of the power of the air. Hmm, demonic activity. We see that in the, the sons of God, the Nephilim, if you will. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all. Every one of us once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children deserving of God's solution in verse 5 of chapter 6, which was that he saw the wickedness of the man was great in the earth, and he decided to blot us all out. Verse 4, but God. Just as we see that intervention of God in chapter 6, verse 8, where he says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God, so are we reminded even more emphatically that the deliverance comes from God in that verse 4 of chapter 2, Ephesians. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not our own, your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. In Genesis chapter 6, we are reminded in the beginning of how the, the depravity and the brokenness in sinful world is increasing, is multiplying. If there was a, a better adjective to describe how rapidly we were getting even more bad, bad to worse, if you will, I would use it, but I can't think of it. And then we're also told from verses 5 to verse 7 how God plans on dealing with it. 
And in this overcast cloud of judgment from God, piercing through it is a ray of grace, a ray of mercy, a ray of deliverance. As I close this morning, I want you to hear that. Whatever overcast clouds of of trials, of challenges, maybe you even think it's judgment, there is a ray. There is a ray that is piercing through and it is the favor of the Lord upon your life. You might not always be able to make sense of it, but as long as God is for you and God is with you, you've already won. You've already won. So if you're here this morning and you don't feel like you're worthy, in fact, you don't even feel like you should be inside this room, then you can never be more right and wrong at the same time. You are unworthy apart from Christ, but you definitely belong in this room because me, you, everybody here, apart from the Spirit of God, are perpetuants of these first four verses of chapter six. But because God has found favor on us, we can worship with confidence. We can live with peace in the midst of the storm. We can look and be grieved by the brokenness around us, but yet still have an impenetrable hope about the deliverance of our Lord and Savior. And because of it, even when hardship comes, we will not be shaken. So my prayer for us this morning is that in all things, we would be reminded of the favor of the Lord upon our lives. When the arrows of the enemy come through bills, through hard arguments and disagreements with your loved ones, through uncertainties about the future, there is something you can hold on to that will always come through as it did for Noah. The favor of the Lord is upon you. Again, as I close, if you are here and you do not know the Lord as Savior, you are here for a reason. And that his favor is here, offered to you through Jesus Christ. And I just want to say this to you, side comment. Jesus has been all through this text. Everywhere I've said God, I've said Jesus. And everywhere I've said God, I've said the Holy Spirit. So when I speak of the favor of God, I'm speaking of the favor of God that shows itself in a way that we all know very well, being his death and resurrection on the cross. But that same Jesus is the same Jesus that showed mercy to Noah in Genesis chapter 6. And we do well not to miss that. So I pray that as we are a people that preach and proclaim the God who is one but three in person, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that we will encounter him in his fullness and be transformed in his fullness also. So if you're here and you don't know the Lord, you don't have a relationship with him, then I want to argue that the favor of the Lord has come this day to give you an opportunity to turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus. If that's you this morning, please meet with any elder or me or the people that lead worship after the service. We can walk through the next steps. Will you bow your heads and pray with me?